Um, uh, my name is uh, Jamie Wallace. I'm from Ignite Technology. Uh, we are a tier one partner uh, for, for CA Broadcom. Um, we are delighted uh, to partner with Broadcom um, and serve our customers here in the Middle East. Um, the, the event this uh, this year, we, we've tried to create a uh, an agenda that we believe will be most impactful and, and, and add the most value uh, uh, to PPM professionals um, uh, here in the region. Uh, we've tried to take uh, uh, topics and agendas uh, from across industry um, that, that we think will uh, um, allow you to be uh, more effective um, uh, within your organizations uh, when uh, taking part in those um, uh, planning and scoping discussions uh, for your future PPM journey. Um, so, um, I, I, as has already been said, you know, we're really keen for, this, uh, for the session to be as interactive um, as possible. Um, we have uh, a great representation um, in the community uh, from some of the largest uh, and most prestigious organizations from across the region. Um, and uh, I, I, I hope that this event will be uh, will add a lot of value to you. Um, we welcome feedback on the event. And if there are uh, suggested topics um, that you would like us to cover in a subsequent series of, of, of webinars, um, we're, we're very open uh, to that feedback. So, uh, without further ado, uh, we'll uh, we'll get things kicked off, um, and uh, I'll hand over uh, to my colleague uh, Mark Lighton uh, from Broadcom, um, uh, who will uh, will walk us through uh, the first session. Over to you, Mark. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Jamie. Thank you for that introduction. Um, the usual sound check. Can, every, can you hear me well, Jamie? Yes, yes, we, 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 we can hear you well. And uh, uh, yeah, you're good to go. Okay, well, thank you very much. Well, good morning again. Uh, I think we're in the morning time zone, most of us. Uh, my name is Mark Leighton. I'm an advisor at Broadcom for our value ops portfolio, which includes the Clarity product. For me, it's still morning. It's just after dawn as I'm based in the Netherlands. Uh, quick comparison with uh, your area of the world. It's raining, it's windy, and it's 12 degrees. So that must make you feel good when you look outside your windows over there. So unfortunately, as Jamie said, we can't be in a room face to face having a coffee and a snack to talk about this. But uh, nevertheless, I'm very happy to be part of the event. Um, today, I would like to introduce you to what we call digital product management, which is a concept and a, a movement we see in the market, and it's getting stronger and stronger. And then after that, I want to touch on the Clarity Roadmap, have a look at where we are and where we will be going in, let's say, the next, next six months. Uh, the roadmaps these days are not that far away in the future because everything is developed agile. We are working with program increments. We are releasing practically every quarter. So the outlooks are not covering years, but it's all, uh, it's still very interesting. So having said all that, let's uh, get going. And the first part of the presentation is about digital product management. Now, these days, Everything is about the product. I mean, if we talk to organizations, the, the word product comes up more and more. And there's a clear shift from a project-oriented company to a product-oriented company. And products, obviously, they come in many shapes. Right? They, they, it's not always the same tangible thing that you hold in your hand. There are a large variety of products. And one thing they have in common is that it's always about the value of the product. Right. What are we delivering? What is the value of that thing that we call a product? So it's a shift that's, that's really in full motion. And it's not, it's not all new. I mean, in 2018, Gartner did a research where uh, already 55% of organizations stated that they're moving from a project to a product. And in about a month, 2021, it's expected that at least 40% of large organizations 
will have kind of completed uh, a transformation to be product oriented opposed to project oriented. Now, there are numerous reasons to do it, but if you think and listen to what we want in our market space, then the word value comes up a lot, right? We want to deliver value to the customer. And this can be our internal customer. This can be our business units that absorb IT services, or it can be our, our end customers, our consumers that really need our product. We want to deliver value to them. And how do we deliver the value? Well, we deliver value through a product, right? We try to sell them something which gives them value. So looking at what we do from a product perspective has one very big advantage is and that's that it takes us closer to our customer because we both talk about the object that delivers value to them. And in the little uh, spider web graph on the right, you can see that that's actually one of the highest scoring benefits, which is the better engagement between IT and business. And so in IT, obviously they talk, we talk in this case about digital products, which is usually software, something we create in IT. But obviously software is in many physical products as well. I mean, even the smallest electronic device, the smallest uh, kitchen equipment these days has software in it. So you shouldn't think about it too, too, too isolated as a software product or a program. No, there are software components everywhere, which are all actually digital products. Now, there are clear differences between a project and a product. But if we look at the project, it's a set of related activities, right? We got a work breakdown structure and there are activities in there that are all tied together. And in the end, they will deliver something. The project also has a clear beginning and an end date. We start somewhere and we plan to finish at a date that is kind of fixed. It's all predictive. We, we do it up front. We deliver what we, we also define up front what the delivery is going to be. We try to gather as much requirements and put them all in so we can work to that. And it creates like a, a product or a service or a result. And then there's an explicit funding on it, which means we dedicate an amount of people and we dedicate an amount of money to it. And then we start running it. That's what we used to call a project and they are still around. There's nothing wrong with projects. They will still be executed. They will all be in place. But when we look at how we're going to achieve our goals, we are talking more about a product and a product is a sustained asset. It's something which immediately or in the longer term will deliver value to our customers, which means value to the company. It has a life cycle, so there is no predefined start and end date. It, we don't know when it will end. It depends on multiple variables and parameters. So it's an ongoing, it's an ongoing uh, activity, which also causes it to have adaptive planning. So we don't plan it all up front. Plans for the product are made along its life cycle. And again, it depends on what happens in the market. How are the competitors moving? Is our product still good enough to give us the value? Or should we really change it and make it uh, extremely innovative again? So we have continuous improvements that meet the needs of the customers and that meet the changes in the market space. And it should deliver value that can be articulated in reasonable business terms, right? So we should understand from a business perspective why is this delivering value to our market space? And it doesn't have a one-time funding, it's recurring funding. After every so many months, we evaluate our product, we look at it, and we define how much more funding we're gonna put into it. Sometimes it may be more, sometimes when the product's doing reasonably well, it may be a little less. So it's a different thing than a project. Now, what is it then? Well, it, it, can be, it can be all kind of stuff, right? It, it delivers value. Uh, an example we give here is an airline check-in service, which exists out of a number of activities. It 
can be about seat selection. Uh, how do you handle your baggage? I mean, are you a frequent traveler? <clears throat> do you want to upgrade your seat? All of this together delivers a product, a service to your customer that delivers value. And the objective of this pro product is obviously to optimize the boarding process and to get your passengers uh, on board quick and safe. And, but the outcome of this service is a decreased cost due to late departure because you got your things well in order. And if you do it really nice, it could also increase customer loyalty because you're offering something which is of value to the customer. So the airline check-in service could be considered a product which is made up in this case of many software components but there can all be also be some physical components in there. Now, about the roles we see when we talk about a product. And this is something which, uh, which comes up often. And, and unfortunately, when, when we speak to companies and we talk about this product orientation and how far they are in the, uh, com in the transition, they say, yeah, 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 we, we were already uh, well, well on our way. We've uh, rebranded all our project managers to be product managers, which is not exactly the way it's going to work, right? So it's a different role. But if you look at a product manager, it's the person that talks to the customer, right? It's the individual which understands the value of the product, that thinks about the strategic vision of it, uh, that can be held accountable for the business results. I mean, it's his product, it's his responsibility to define what does the product need to be successful in the market space, right? This is the person that usually spends most of its time talking to customers. And again, the customer can be your internal customer or it can be the external consumer. These folks are on the business side. Right? They talk with the business layers, they talk with the customer. The other important role is the product owner, which is a person who is much closer to the technology of the product and who talks to the people who create the product. And so he has a good understanding of what is the product made of, what are the components. Uh, he manages the technical aspects of the delivery of the product. If you talk with agile teams, well, there are always technical aspects, right? It's about integration, there are dependencies, et cetera. This person understands the technical dependencies. He understands the technical complexity and he can be held accountable for delivering a technologically sound product. He usually talks to the product manager a lot to understand what the need of the product manager is. But in general, most of his time, the product owner is talking to the product teams, talks to the teams that create the product. How, does the, how do they want to create it? What are the requirements for the components? How do the components work together? And if it doesn't work together, or if there is some kind of an extreme delay or a technical complexity, this will be the person talking to the product manager explaining a potential delay in the delivery of a feature, right? So these two roles are very prominent in the company where you got the business side represented by the product manager and the more technical creation side often presented by a product owner. And what they always will talk about and what is kind of the leading, the leading element when we talk about products, it's the value. Right? The value, which is the importance, the worth, or the usefulness of something that we are creating. And this, again, it's not a single thing. You can define this in, in, in various ways. The first value we usually think of is a financial value. Right? So how much money are we going to get from this product? Uh, or is it something that saves us a lot of cost? Does it puts us in a better market position? These are all value, very concrete value definitions, but there's more to value. We can also talk about a social value or a political value, where if you, for example, deliver something which is very uh, 
sustainable or socially responsible, it may be that you're accepted by the audience better and people are more likely to buy your product or to use your service. If you comply to regulations, if you work uh, according a government described process, you may be, you may get a tick mark by the government or tick mark by a political institute, which gives you approval for acting in a certain market space, which is also valued. A few rules on the value element is that it should be agreed upon and by, by it should be agreed upon by and for the organization. So it should deliver value to the organization as an as as a whole. It should always be described in a way that people understand it, even if they are non-technical persons. Now, especially when you talk about software, I mean, very often technical people and software people, they can describe value elements in a language that nobody understands, which is not going to work. So it has to be something we understand as a whole in the company. And we should be able to measure it. And where we used to think about KPIs, key performance indicators, which were very much operational focused. We like to measure value by objective key results, right? And those are more like business metrics. And the objective key results, they should be able to influence the business decision, right? So an objective key result could be the market percentage we have. Right. It's our goal to become number two in a certain market, which means that one of the key results should be that we have at least 70% market space or something like that. So the OKR can be the percent market space, which is something that can influence a business decisions. If we're not doing well enough, we may need to do things different. So the value is a very, very important aspect of the product. It's also a very important aspect of how do we manage it? What decisions do we make to change the way we approach our customers? Now, if you think about a traditional PMO, then that kind of institute may suffer in a product oriented enterprise. A traditional PMO focuses and reports primarily on the operational efficiency metrics. Very common, are we within planning and are we within budget? Right? It's very operational. Uh, it's not always tied to the business. I mean, a project can run perfectly in time. It can perfectly stay within budget. What not necessarily means that it delivers value to the organization. It doesn't say a lot from a business perspective if you run within time and you run within budget. If you have switched to agile methodology, and we talk about burn down charts and velocity and story points, well, there's nobody in the business that understands that. So if that comes into reporting, it doesn't really help either. And besides that, all the agile teams do is very hard to translate into financial. I, I mean, delivering story points, having a certain velocity, etc. It's very hard to translate it into financial. So it doesn't ring too many bells at the business side either. And on top of that, it's still unfortunately true that in many organizations, the PMO is not that well aware of the corporate strategy. So a lot goes on, a lot is delivered, but it's not sure that it all adds up to the strategy. So if you're really product oriented, and you work with the concepts that we just discussed in the earlier slides, then the traditional PMO may suffer. So what we would like to see as a transformation is that a PMO switches his management focus and acts more on products right, instead of projects. So they look at a product, look at the progress, see how that aligns to the corporate strategy and how it contributes to the strategic objectives. And it starts reporting on that. Now, there are still projects underneath that have to be executed, but the progress, the reporting, et cetera, is from a product perspective. 
it's not so much about stage gates and where do we pass a gate to go to the next stage. It's more about life cycle management. Although you also have kind of stage, right? We can have an introduction stage, you can have a maturity, you can have a nurture, you can have a support stage. There are different stages in the life cycle of a product, but it's not so clearly defined as the traditional stage gate model that we have. And they will look at funding from a different perspective too. It's not this one time allocation of funds to make the product successful. No, it's an over time evaluation of how much money are we going to put into which product. And it's all to do with where is it in its life cycle, how successful is it in its market space, and how much value does it deliver. So in a product oriented enterprise, the PMO will kind of act as a digital product manager to connect business outcome to execution. And so they talk much more business terms, they are much more aligned to the strategy, and they communicate with the product owners in the technical space about what are we doing? When will we get features? Is there any technical complexity that we should take into consideration for delivering the product to the market space? That's the type of language that the PMO should talk in a product oriented enterprise. There's a lot more to say about Product oriented enterprises, but I think this from a high level is a concept that most of us will perfectly well understand. So let's have a look. How do we, from a clarity perspective, how do we anticipate this new way of working and this new way of orientation? Well, the first step in the, in, in a product oriented enterprise is that. Hi, Mark. Hi, yes. Mike, Jimmy. Yeah, um, I, I just I was trying to pick my moment of when, when might be the right time to interject with with a question, and maybe this is the uh, maybe yeah, this is the ahead. point. Um, I, I was just interested in your experience in in uh, particularly with some of the major uh, customers that you're engaged with in Europe. Maybe you could give some in some some of your insight into where you see organizations on that journey and that transition from projects to products. Um, it's something that, you know, we and Broadcom, you know, we, we, we see in the market and it's absolutely the direction of travel. We're speaking to a lot of our customers about it right now. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm interested, to, you know, do, do you see many examples of customers who've reached the end of that journey? Would you say there's a lot of customers really at the start of that journey? I'm just kind of interested in your, your view of the, the current state of play. It's, I think there's, a th well, from a, as conceptual and theoretical, many organizations have kind of embarked on the journey, right? So the first things we see, and this is, you know, it, it's, it's not necessarily connected, but it's very often linked to an agile transformation, right? Where because if you think about enterprise agile, it's also very much about value delivery. So what we see in what, what we face in a lot of organizations is they have accepted that they want to go product oriented. So the first thing that, that we see changing in these companies is the names and the terms they use. And that's, it's a coincidence that we're on this slide at this stage. But that's what, what we see happening in organizations. They start renaming artifacts to align with what the business talks about, right? And the business as well starts to rename some of their terminology. Like in this, in this slide, for example, value stream. I mean, a value stream is something which comes from agile at scale. You know, it's, it's, it's a definition that comes from the agile, uh, ag agile world. It defines the, all the activities within a company that are contributing to delivering value to the customer. So if you talk about a product, it includes everything from the initial, let's say, market orientation the decision to create a certain product, to the creation of the product, the support of the product, the 
the marketing of the product, the selling of the product, everything that comes that has to do with that product is kind of captured in a what they call a value stream. Right. So what I notice in companies I talk to is that they start using that terminology at both a business and a more or less IT side. They start to report based on these terminologies and they are looking, and this is not an easy thing. A lot of them are looking at how do we define objective key results, right? So what are the key results that we want to monitor, which will tell us how well are we doing with regard to achieving a strategic objective? And if you think about it initially, it, well, it, it may not sound that complex, right? But it turns out that that's a very complex part of the game, defining OKRs. How will we monitor them? How will we manage them? And can we roll them up to, to show how we are doing with regard to a strategic objective? So in, in many organizations, Jamie, I think people are converting the terminology. They're starting to manage based on this new terminology and definition of objects. And they are, uh, they're very busy defining the new measure points. So, OKRs. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, not a lot of them have completed that journey. I must say it, that it's still a mixture of old and new. Yeah. And, and it's, it, it's kind of still that traditional people process technology triangle where it, all organizations you know if they have a started to organize themselves in terms of product owners product managers then you don't have the right stakeholders in place to make these decisions and and and, and uh, be involved in these activities of defining the product that an organization is delivering um also the, you know the, there isn't an audience there to define and shape those processes and those okrs and then also on on the technology side you know traditional ppm systems have been focused on a more portfolio program project so without having all of those pieces of the jigsaw in place then organizations are just going to spin their wheels and not really get anywhere on this top topic but as i'm sure you're about to share with us you know um we, we, you know there there's um uh you know we, we are able to provide all three of those uh, uh key factors um which uh, enable customers to achieve uh, the, this digital uh, product management so I'll, I'll hand back to you mark and uh, without stealing your thunder um if you can take us through uh, these steps yeah i will yep yep thank you jamie it's a good question though and it's it again as i said it everybody's engaged with it um i've seen few very few organizations that kind of already pushed it through in its entirety. So it's, it's a journey, but uh, one of the first steps that we just touched on is like, you should look at how, what is the labels? What are the names? What are you managing? Right? In a traditional company where we manage projects, projects do not reflect the way a business operates. I mean, they don't usually don't reflect products or services or anything that you're trying to sell to your market. So if you manage your organization in projects, that's the first disconnect with business because a project won't ring a bell to the business unless you give it a very fancy uh, recognizable name. Right? So we should change the language that companies talk these days. And as I mentioned, it's very closely aligned to agile transformations. It's well, about differences in funding, it's, it's the iterations that are different, but you know, terms like a value stream, a capability, which is usually a bigger group. It's a capability. It's something you want to be able to do, which may consist of products, platforms. These all have features, etc. These are the words and the language you should start uh, talking about because that reflects the way your business operates. You should also have a way to reflect the structure of your products. And so how does it all come together? I mean, if you have a capability that consists out of multiple products, it would be 
very nice and come in handy if we could show how does it all link together? What's the hierarchy of such a product line? Or if we offer a service, like just think back of that uh, airline check-in service, what are the components that come into play for that? And how do we try to improve that? And you should be able to link it all to tangible business outcomes, right? So everything we do should be connected to a business outcome. Now, in Clarity, we anticipate to this by allowing you to reflect your business portfolio structure, right? And to support the funding model that you currently have in place. This is primarily done by what we call custom investment types. So in Clarity, out of the box, and you all know we have a project object and we have an ID object which are still valid, which still, which are still very much used in any organization, but we also allow you to define your custom investment type, which could be, in example, a value stream, or a capability, or a service, or anything that your organization uses to reflect their business model. What is that product that we're selling? We allow you to define it, and we also allow you to give it the, the functionality that you need to manage it. So you can define work for it. You can define financials for it. You can allocate agile teams to it. So it comes with a lot of the functionality that we also provide for projects, but it allows you to define your own object with, the own, with your own attributes to manage it like your business operates. We also uh, allow you to reflect it in the structure that's, that's, that it's used in within the company. So we offer multi-dimensional hi hierarchies. It's not just one hierarchy that has to be defined and fixed for the entire organization. No, you can define a hierarchy by stakeholder. So if you're a product line manager, you can look at it from that perspective. If you are a territory manager, you can look at a slightly different view, which takes into account the territory you manage. So it's a flexible way of reflecting the structure of your product lines, services, organization, whatever you want to look at it. But, and it can be done from a role, from a stakeholder perspective. And we also offer you the possibility to monitor these OKRs that we have defined to do all that. Now, in the deck, I've just included two screenshots that illustrate what I just talked about. Um, it's, it's very high level, so it, it doesn't reveal anything. But when we talk about defining your own investment types, this top screen gives you kind of an impression, right? So besides having a project and an ID, we allow you to define your strategy, to define a value stream, a product line, products, objective, business outcomes. All of these can now be defined as an object you manage, and it can reflect the way your business operates. Right? We can map it. We can map these investments to business understanding. So, if you have a product line credit cards, it can come with a defined customer journey. It's it, it gives you insight in the year over year, year growth percentages, etc. And these are just snippets from from a product setup, but it gives you an idea that you can define your own investments, you can define your OKRs, and you can start managing it the way your company operates. So step one, think about the naming and the objects that you manage within your company, want to manage in your company. This is an example of such a hierarchy, right? So in this case, it starts with retail banking, then it has a number of product lines underneath, home lending, credit cards, monetary transfers, etc. And then you can have your hierarchy with, for example, business outcomes or with, or with more individual products that you want to see in the hierarchy, depending on your position in the company, your view on the activities. Step two, if you've defined these objects, so you know what you're running your company on, 
it would be really good to understand what the strategy of your organization is. And so we, we, we should define the strategy and we should map our business objectives onto this strategy. So why are we trying to achieve this? And if we've defined the objectives, we should define objective key results. So how are we gonna monitor how well we're doing? And all of that is necessary to understand your product performance. So that's what we do next. How does Clarity support you in doing that? Well, we enable you to capture your strategy and to register your business outcomes. Right? A strategy can be a custom investment type. You can define as much detail on it as you like. We allow you to define roadmaps, a very, very powerful artifact to manage how well you're doing with regard to your strategy is a roadmap, right? But not exactly how well we're doing, how you want to achieve your objective. That's a roadmap. So we allow you to define flexible roadmaps. Again, can be looked at from different perspectives that enable you, that guide you to reach your strategic objective. Uh, on all of that, we obviously foresee tracking progress and also managing the risk and aligning the funding to this strategy. So how do we prioritize? Where do we put our money? Well, we have to align it to where the strategy wants us to go. So all of these supporting tasks are provided by Clarity. Again, few snapshots from the product. The top one captures a strategy. So what is the priority? What's the description? What's the outcomes? We can have objectives, right? Or an objective, uh, yeah, an objective. Like we want to be the top three banks in defined eight scale markets. What's the outcome? Well, from a top three bank, we start measuring that. The target is number one. We always go for the highest and our actual position is number two. So we're doing pretty good here. Obviously we have a roadmap. How do we get there? Right, the loan application product. Number of categorization here gives a clear insight to what will we deliver in what release. And then there is a strategy mix analysis on it. So we provide you the means to come up with a connected model to do continuous planning and to do reporting from a business perspective. So we define the objects we measure, we defined our strategy, our objectives and the key results. Now, how are we gonna prioritize where we need to execute on? And again, some of the concepts have been around for a long time because also when we did projects, we had to prioritize which projects are we going to run, which are the most important ones for our business. With products, it's more or less the same, right? But with products, it's more flexible. It, you need to be more adaptive. So depending on the outcomes, you need to change your funding. You need to change the priority of certain products. You need to align it to the market flexibility and to the work in progress. If the market is asking for a certain product or feature at this very moment, and you're developing a product which is not going to be ready within the next half year, you should really ask yourself, is it worth developing this product when we already know that we're going to be very late to market and maybe most of the market space has already been taken by our competitors? Or should we put our money on something else? You should still be able to compare plans. And in all of that, you should be able to understand your product performance. So again, how do we support it? Well, as I said, we provide product roadmaps, which can be perfectly aligned to your product strategy. So in the roadmap, you can capture your strategic goals. You can put your features on and you can see how does the product aligned to our strategy. Where do we want to take it? As we're always working on a product and there will be updated statistics on the progress and on how well it's doing, we can sync the execution underneath the product, which could be a project, into the roadmap. So it's not 
the disconnected tool. I mean, there are many roadmap tools on the market space, on the market. Most of them live in isolation. They are very strong in creating a graphical picture of where we want to go, nice roadmap, but they're not connected to the execution. One of the major advantages of Clarity is that it manages the execution so we know very well where we are and it can connect it to the roadmap. So it's not a virtual thing. It's something real that shows facts that are, that are real from your execution layers. We allow you to set the thresholds and the targets, and we allow you to rate funding to progress and risk. So we allow you to do quarterly funding. As the people know that use Clarity, we have, for every investment, we have a cost plan and we have a budget plan. We can release budget in line with, for example, a PI, if you're doing agile development. Some screenshots to illustrate. We allow you to virtualize your plan. Right? So where are we going? When do we plan to do what? Within that same roadmap view, we allow you to show how well are we doing. So we have objectives defined from random described objectives. We have targets with a target description. What's the actual measure and what's the target attainment? This is the information which helps our organization make the, bus the business decisions. This is steering where we want to go. What is our objective? What's the key measurement and how well are we doing? We still allow you to define targets how much benefit do we want to achieve with a certain part of our investment? And thresholds, how much OPEX have we got? Another threshold, if you're working in an agile organization, is capacity, right? So what are the story points that our teams all together can deliver within a certain time box? Well, our limitation here is that our team capacity is 600 story points. So if we can categorize our products and our product features and estimate story points, we can kind of take that into consideration when making decisions, right? And all of that should be aligned to the, to the, to the let's say, defined business outcomes that we want to achieve. And then the final one, after these first three steps would be to empower your people, right? So if we've done all this, then we should enable our people to do the job and do the job the way they want it. So we're not gonna prescribe which methodology they have to use. They can still use traditional work with a sequential work breakdown structure, read a project because that's the best way to deliver something. They can use agile methodologies because that's the way we develop software and they can pretty much use everything in between, which is like an activity list with to do's. All of that is in our solution box and it's meant to reduce the waste. So it's meant to make people work efficient and do it in the way they like to do it. And at best, it's the purpose. So we have people motivated by purpose, right? So you, you want to make them aware, why are they doing it? I mean, there are plenty of researches that have revealed that if your workforce know why they are creating something, they get much more motivated. So also in agile teams, you should connect their work to strategy and goals. The folks should understand why are we developing this feature? You want to give them the freedom to work the way they want. As I just mentioned, if it's traditional, work traditional. If it's agile, work agile. If it's something in between, we probably can meet that in between. And we want to eliminate the work for work, automate things, strap out the routine tasks, make it efficient. In order to do that, we obviously have a lot of the functionality you just saw uh, in the former slides within Clarity, which is very much focused on business and business outcomes. You can work with a work breakdown structure. You can work with to-do lists. We give you very, very handy and instant status reports. So you don't have to put in a lot of work to create a status report. 
On the other side, if you have agile teams, well, obviously from the CA uh, factory and Broadcom manufacturing, we can offer Rally, which is a very strong tool for uh, enterprise at scale. It's not necessarily limited to Rally. I mean, I know there's a lot of Jira in the market space. So if you got Jira on this side of your company, we can still do a whole lot and exchange a lot of information that contributes to this concept. And all is geared up for making things efficiency and making people work efficient. So in summary, and I clicked through the animation here, if you look at Clarity, we offer a lot for companies who have gone into the digital product management route. I think we can perfectly well support a product oriented company. There is quite uh, an extensive blog on our website in the community. There is a, a blog uh, called from project to project products. I think it already has like uh, something like 20 or 30 posts. So I could definitely recommend you to have a look. Uh, they're very short blogs, very informational, very much to the point to read more about all this. And that kind of concludes our first section. And I think we are way behind time actually, Jamie. So we're gonna speed up a little bit. Uh, clarity, vision and roadmap. Okay, so where so are we Mark, today? Mark, Mark just, to, to, just, just to come in. So um, we, we are behind time, but, but I think the, uh, the level of detail and uh, that, that you went into into that first session was fantastic. Um, and I'm sure the, the audience you know, appreciate th those insights. Um, yeah, so don't, don't feel rushed on, on, on the content and uh, uh, just deliver the next section um, in, in, in the pace of which you had in mind. Thank you. Okay, thank you. That's a comfort. That's, thank you. So, yeah, the next is the vision and roadmap of Clarity. So, currently, where we are, I mean, for uh, people who were not aware of it, we changed our SaaS platform. So, we moved all our Clarity SaaS customers from uh, our kind of old Colo platform, which was more like a uh, a hosted model where we operated an, inf an infrastructure within a, uh, a public data center. We moved all our SaaS customers to the Google Cloud Platform. That was quite an effort and it did take some development capacity. So we were a bit behind on our development, but we're catching up quickly because we finished it. Uh, what we are focusing on now is to kind of complete the transition of the classic user interface into the new UX. I think we, we converted about maybe 80, 90% of what we could do in the classic, uh, also in the new UX, with exception of certain features and functions that nobody used in the classic either. So we didn't, we didn't take the effort to convert those, but the rest is pretty much done. After this, we wanna accelerate the digital product management support. Right? So we're gonna build more functionality in the product to support the product oriented companies, to better connect business to the outcomes and to provide more traceability on how we got where we are. We wanna improve our financial management and focus areas for doing that is like uh, the drawdown funding that you'll hear more about later on. Financial allocation module to help you calculate total cost of ownerships. There's gonna be more work orchestration from a hierarchical point of view. So in the hierarchy views, we're gonna include work information and effort statistics. And there's gonna be, uh, well, functionality for capital slash headcount in time-phased planning. And then when we're done with that, which is the longer term, we're gonna, we're gonna keep on working to make things frictionless. So we wanna make it all smooth and we wanna take more work for work out of the tool. We're also going to try introducing artificial intelligence. We're going to work on our mobile platform, etc. But this is in three high steps, the, uh, the future outlook of where we intend to go with the product. Now, this is still roadmap, which means it's not a commitment. It's an expectation. We do work agile. Uh, things may change. We deliver on a cadence. So the, the release is always coming out 
but not all the features may be in it because of technical reasons, priority reasons, etc. Now, for the people who are kind of new to the product, I mean, the product has gone through an enormous evolution over the last four years. In 2016, we started to introduce the new user experience, which was all based on market research we did, where we found that people needed easier ways of working. I mean, Clarity was a very powerful product, but it was not very easy to operate. And it also wasn't really pretty to look at, to be honest. Right? It, was a, it was a bit of a boring business application. And there's nothing wrong with a boring business application if it does the job. But when you get your new employees, these youngsters out of university used to a tablet and a phone, they just don't want to work with a boring business application. So in order to get them engaged, we started to renew our complete product. Uh, the screens you see here are all nice and graphic examples of what happened over four years. So we look at projects in a different way, we allow you to present them by Kanban style boards. We give you like working lists. We give you social media type collaboration. There's a roadmap features. There's hierarchy features. There's a whole new set of functionality in the current clarity that has all spun up this new user experience uh, initiative that we started four years ago. Three words in that guided us through that journey is simple. It has to be, I mean, people have to do the job without too much complexity. It has to be usable. So it has to serve every role in your organization and it has to be powerful. You need to get real results out of it. Now there is kind of a conflict of interest between simple and powerful. You can't do everything powerful in a very simple way but it's still the goal that we try to achieve with the new user experience. Even though it's a roadmap, on November 9, we released Clarity 15.9, so it's very fresh. Uh, it's available for all of you now, so I would like to touch on a few highlights in there. As I said, we lost some capacity to the SaaS migration, so there's quite a lot of uh, usability features in here, which are very nice and handy usable things. Not that much big new features, but we are catching up on these big new features. But 15.9, a very simple but often asked for feature is the ability to put a color on your menu bar and logon screen. And if you have a production and a development system, in the old days, people distinguished them by using different color schemes and logon screens. We can now do the same with the UX, right? So you allow you to make things, for example, green. That's what you like. Another simple one, ask for a lot. Can we indicate something as a favorite? Yes, we allow you to star things now, which is actually your favorite list. You can do it throughout the product. You can save them. You can filter on start. So if you filter on start, all your favorites appear in that filter with that corresponding view. We expanded field level security to custom objects and sub objects. So you can now by attribute put security on these objects too. We give you a bulk action on a grid, not on all the grids, but if you want to do a delete of multiple objects in multiple instances of an object at once. We give you a list, select and delete. We make the flyout more usable. People who work with the new UX, you got the flyout showing details on a selected line. If you would move out of that screen and come back, the flyout was closed. Now we remember the state. So if it's open when you leave, it's open when you return. It's a personal setting. So it remembers it by individual. There's also a quick save. We have this tremendously powerful feature of composing and saving your own views. It took three clicks to do it, right? You change things, you clicked on save as, you selected your name, and you clicked on confirm. We replaced that by a single save. So if you now change your view, this one become active 
click on it and it's saved. And the last one I want to mention here is the use of a grid in the flyout screen. So if you look at your work breakdown structure and you look at the task defined resource plan in the flyout, we could have details on the task. Now we can also use a grid. And in this case, it shows the assignment grid. So which resources have been assigned to this task. You can scroll through it. If you want to see all the information, there's an expand button, which will pop up the total assignment screen with all the details in it. So these are some very handy features that we delivered in 15.9 and that are now available for all of you to, uh, to install and to use. So what's coming up in the next, let's say, one to two releases? And remember, it's an iterative model. So when we have a minimal viable product, we release it to market. It won't be perfect. It won't have everything we plan to build for it. But we release the first version of it as soon as we think it can offer you value. This is our internal Clarity product roadmap. And we use Clarity to do our road mapping. Now, this is just one of the roadmaps. We have different roadmaps for architecture and technology. We have massive initiatives that have their own roadmap, like uh, support for uh, disabled people in the product that has their own roadmap. But we really use Clarity to manage the roadmap of the Clarity product. So just to make you aware of that, we, as we like to say, we drink our own champagne. So what are we planning to do? We want to increase the bulk action functionality on grids, um, which means selecting more. And I just got um, a mention that the time's almost up, so I'm gonna I'm gonna speed up a little bit. Um, bulk actions on a grid. This is interesting. We are introducing business rules, which should replace, eliminate complex workflows to do simple things. So we will allow you to define a rule, for example, if the finish date is 30 days from today, turn the color to red. That's the only thing you need to define. You don't need to create a whole process to do things like that. So this is going to be a real nice addition there. We're going to expand our to-do functionality, which allows you to create to-dos that are not necessarily connected to a project. So you can have kind of system-wide to-dos will offer you reporting more times than some. In the hierarchy, we're going to add the same as we have for projects and IDs. We're going to add a grid view and we want to add a board view. So besides just looking at the graphical picture of the hierarchy, you will have a grid icon here and a board icon that will show everything in your hierarchy in the grid or in the board view. There will be usability features like expanding, etc. This is another one that's asked for a lot. In the new UX, we can't really show you grids with uh, the result of a SQL query. So we're going to allow you to create multi-object grids. So this shows the output. The out, the, this is the output of a query that, con that, that queries multiple objects. In the group by mode, we're going to allow aggregation of timescale values. So if you group by capital, it would roll up cost. It would roll up the, the numbers, in this case cost, but it wouldn't do it for a timescale value attribute. That's going to be added. On the roadmap, we still use a classic version of the grid, which means you don't have the advanced filter, you don't have the search bar, and you don't have the TSP export. All of that is going to be upgraded to the last version of the grid. For cosmetics, we're going to allow rich text formatting for certain fields. Not all of them, but for some of them, we will allow you to use rich text formatting. Uh, date shifting and CSV import. Auto schedule light is what we like to name it. It gives you the ability to shift a bunch of tasks, for example, two or three weeks all at once. And we're going to allow you to import tasks from a CSV file. Functionality that we use a lot 
is the channel. Channel allows you to jump to a classic UI or a classic report or something outside of the Clarity product. We offer them by project only five. We will expand that number to, I think, 10, 15 maybe. We'll also give you a channel page, which is a menu entry where you can open up a page with a number of channels on it. This is a big feature. This is drawdown funding. And I think the picture explains pretty much what it does. It allows you to fund a certain product from different sources, like a platform budget and a product budget, and to keep track of who funded what. There will be supporting screens, allowing you to define the business case for funding. You know, like, why do we need it? Why do I want that money? There will be graphicals, um, where does the funding come from? You know, like SAP rollout, there's a program, global rollout, automation technology. Another conceptual design of what that would look like. You know, what is funded from a certain project. And on the mobile time registration app, uh, we will enable approval. And we also plan to offer action items on the mobile time. When you look at integration with agile platforms, this is uh, a major focus. So we will continuously improve it. We'll provide new functionality to better integrate between Clarity and Rally. Uh, explicitly, that means also between Clarity and other agile tools, but it's something, especially with digital product management that has our attention. Longer term is also artificial intelligence and machine learning. We, we want, we're trying to develop something that really adds value and not just a, a chat bot, but it's not on the roadmap for the next year. So I think this is uh, a bit further down the road, but we're definitely thinking and working on this too. And then I want to close off with the fact that the release numbering will slightly change. So currently we always went from 15.9, 15.9.1 to 16. There's going to be four releases of, in this case, 15.9 and in the future of 16, which have been aligned to our program increments. So there's a base release and then every PI we release a new release number. So it's going to be 15.9.1, 2 and 3, and then it jumps to 16. That's how it will be in the future. So, in most of your areas, you won't just need the shades for the for the regular sun, but now also Clarity is going to kind of uh, request you to wear shades because the future is looking bright. It's really good. A lot of interesting stuff coming up. So, thank you very much for spending time with me, and my apologies for slightly going over time. Um, but uh, thank Jamie, this is what I wanted to share. So handing it over back to you. Excellent. Thank you, Mark. Really, really, really appreciate that. Um, I, I'm I'm getting a, a number of questions uh, to me, you know, directly about the content that you're sharing, um, um, and I'm sure that there's you know questions within the audience. Given the time constraints that we have, um, what I what I propose is that we will take. Um, questions offline on, on this content, and I would encourage any of uh, uh, any of the attendees to reach out uh, to me directly, and, and, and I can uh, uh, connect you with Mark, and you know we can discuss the questions that you have. Um, but in the interest of time, um, I would just thank you, Mark, um, and we will uh, we'll move on to the next topic. Okay, I'll stop sharing. Oh. Thank you, Mark. Okay, so I now have the presenter privileges, so I'll share, share the screen.
Um, in a similar fashion uh, to you, Mark, uh, can can somebody please just confirm that you can everyone can see my screen? Okay. We can see it, Jamie. Okay, perfect. So um, we're, we're a little short on time for this session, um, but but again, as I mentioned, I'm happy to do kind of dedicated sessions uh, uh, with customers and prospects on on this topic um, uh, if we have to get through the content a little too uh, swiftly. Okay, so so let's dive in. So um, I introduce myself and I will be joined in this session with my colleague Mathan, who is uh, uh, 15 plus years experience with Clarity and, and a real SME when it comes to all things uh, reporting relating to Clarity. So what I wanted to cover today was really the state of uh, BI. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, uh, Gartner's Magic Quadrant uh, for BI applications, uh, reporting options with Clarity, uh, a, a very quick demo, and then some of our recommendations. So um, we, we really just wanted to, to highlight a number of points to really set the scene um, and, and, and understand kind of the current state of the market. So. Um, the BI market is growing, you know, and we're seeing that with with all of our customers and all of our prospects. So, uh, all customers now, you know, an important part of the, their you know RFP and their requirement is the ability to integrate with third party uh, BI platforms. This is a, a um, you know an important requirement uh, for all of our existing customers and, and prospects. And you know we're seeing that growth um, um, across the market. And um, uh, one of the statistics that Gartner uh, has put forward in their recent uh, uh, Magic Quadrant survey um, was that uh, by 2022, augmented analytics uh, technology will be ubiquitous, uh, but only 10% of analysts will use its full potential. And, and we, we recognize that uh, with our customers that you know, many customers we speak to and maybe stakeholders aren't even aware that they have um, a, a, an enterprise-wide BI platform. Um, so, you know, without a doubt, you know we're seeing that already. That you know the uh, sometimes the, these tools can be you know significantly underutilized uh, within organisations. And if we're going to deliver the expected benefits and maximise the value of platforms like PPM to our uh, business stakeholders, then we really need to be taking advantage of the capabilities um, that, that, that these BI platforms uh, provide and the data that we have within Clarity um, in order to make uh, uh, better um, uh, uh, business decisions. And, um, a prediction that by 2025, data stories Will be the most widespread way of consuming uh, analytics, um, and and they touch upon frequently this concept of uh, augmented analytics, you know, using machine learning and AI to assist uh, in preparing those uh, insights um, and explaining the data uh, to that audience. So there's a real opportunity uh, opportunity here for vendors, uh, service providers like ourselves, um, and customers. Um, to explore new ways in which we can provide intelligent insights uh, uh, for, for our stakeholders. And if we look at the uh, magic quadrant for 2020 for BI application, you can see that you know, uh, uh, Microsoft Tableau and Click are kind of some of the most uh, prominent players. And, and we see that with our customers. And we have a lot of experience in developing uh, reports and dashboards based on data within Clarity using these uh, third-party uh, BI platforms. Um, most prominently, Microsoft B, uh, Power BI. Um, and uh, importantly, it's, it's important to say that, uh, that TIPCO Jaspersoft, which is the native uh, BI application that's, uh, uh, that comes out of the box with Clarity, um, is, is, a, is a challenger in, in, in this space. So to have um, such a strong BI application native within Clarity that, that serves a, a particular set of use cases like um, stock reports and ad hoc reports, self-service reports, um, that's a really um, important part of Clarity's offering. And if you combine that with the ability to provide reports and dashboards 
in a third party BI platform, such as Microsoft Power BI, um, that really does give us a, a very comprehensive um, solution. So the reporting options within Clarity, um, uh, we, we really just wanted to highlight this uh, set of options that, that, that we have for uh, providing um, uh, reports and dashboards uh, to stakeholders. Um, and uh, I'll cover each of these with, uh, with with their own individual slide. But at a our portlets um, and our advanced reporting via Tipco JasperSoft that includes ad hoc views, uh, reports, whether they be stock or custom, um, and dashboards. And then also we'll be touching upon uh, uh, third party BI platforms. And then after we've just um, explored each of these different options, um, I will hand over, we'll do a short demo, um, and also we'll provide you with some recommendations of when it would be appropriate to use each of these outputs um, and which audiences and which use cases they may serve best. Uh, because certainly for reporting and BI, we, we, we don't think that it is a one-size-fits-all approach. Different use cases require different types of reports and different types of dashboards, uh, depending on the audience um, and the type of data that we're presenting. So um, the first option is that in, in, in the modern UX, as, as Mark was highlighting, um, uh, Broadcom have really been on a journey with, uh, with Clarity and, and, and have completely overhauled uh, the user experience. We refer to this as the modern UX. And uh, a key part of the modern UX are these common uh, grids. Uh, and in, as part of these common grids, uh, we're able to do you know, a whole host of things. So if there's you know, a, a, a quick question that a, a colleague or a, a manager has for you and you need to access that data really quickly and swiftly, it's very easy for any user to be able to quickly configure pages such as this project list view um, to include um, um, you know, easily, you know, adding columns, uh, filtering, sorting, uh, doing group buys, um, and that view um, can be saved, accessed by uh, yourself or other colleagues um, at a later stage. So even though this isn't strictly um, a reporting option, um, the power and flexibility it, it provides may mean that in a number of cases, this may be the quickest and easiest way for you to get at and manipulate the data that you need. Of course, th this can also be exported to CSV. Um, the second option relates to classic UX and, and uh, the, the, the portlets uh, that we're able to uh, uh, create um, and place onto dashboards. Um, so as you can see in this particular example, this is a, a risk dashboard uh, that has been created by Ignite. Um, and we have um, uh, three pie charts uh, uh, of risks by category, impact, and probability. Underneath that, we have a, a portlet, which is more of a, a grid-based portlet um, showing the underlying data. Um, uh, for each of uh, for, for all of the risks in filter, so Clarity out of the box has a very large catalog of uh, of, of portlets, um, all to be used um, at, at, at customers' convenience. But also we can create custom portlets that are based on maybe for more complex requirements uh, that would need to be uh, developed based on a query. Um, and there's a set of uh, stock charting options, uh, all of the uh, uh, common charting options that you would expect, um, and also the ability uh, to export, uh, particularly for the, uh, for, for the grid portlets. Um, in our advanced reporting uh, uh, set of features that is underpinned by JasperSoft uh, technology from Tipco, um, one of the uh, reporting out outputs that we have is ad hoc views. Um, so the ability for a, a, a power user to be able to create their own ad hoc views as and when needed using drag and drop um, uh, capability into the fields, the columns and, 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 uh, uh, and, and filters. Um, and these can be then published as a, as a stock report or can be placed onto a dashboard uh, for other uh, users of the system to consume. Um, we also have the, the stock reports and, and Clarity comes with 50 plus out of the box uh, reports covering things like 
project management, program management, resource time and financial management, and a number of other reports uh, covering other topics um, uh, across the platform. Um, typically, these reports are, you know, would be used uh, where you need a kind of a fixed format of the report um, and maybe you want to apply some uh, brand guidelines. Um, and these can be exported to, into a range of formats, including PowerPoint and PDF, and also can be scheduled to be distributed um, to a predefined audience on a regular cadence. Um, those were examples of some uh, uh, reports. In this instance, it was a project storyboard report. Um, I've also added to the screen some examples of some uh, custom reports uh, that, that we've created for a number of our uh, uh, different customers. Um, so uh, these are an example of how um, a timeline report might look you know, dramatically different from one customer uh, to the next. So all of these reports are custom reports that we've developed using uh, Jaspersoft Report Designer um, and can, uh, we can include and can align ourselves uh, to particular uh, brand guidelines. Uh, also, to do with the advanced reporting inside Clarity is to create dashboards where we would place reports and ad hoc views onto a dashboard to create um, you know, an overall um, a reporting experience uh, for, a, for a particular audience. And we can apply page filters um, uh, so that all of the content is, is dynamically updated. And then uh, finally, uh, the, uh, the ability to use third party BI platforms. So, um, here's a number of a examples of uh, uh, Power BI dashboards um, uh, with really advanced visualizations. Um, and the trend that we're seeing is that a lot of executives um, may have a preferred style, format, and uh, method uh, of uh, receiving uh, their dashboards. So perhaps uh, maybe if it's Power BI or Tableau, uh, they may want to receive all of their reports in that common and consistent uh, style and format. So rather than logging into each and every application, they have one common uh, reporting experience that is connected to all of their applications, including Clarity, and that serves that audience as a single point um, of reference uh, uh, to, to get their management insights. And that's precisely what Clarity uh, can do. And, and, and importantly, and, and a point that uh, my colleague Mathan, I'm sure, will touch upon, um, is that um, one of the key uh, differentiators for Clarity is that out of the box, Clarity comes with its own data warehouse. And that data warehouse makes um, the creation of reports and dashboards with third party BI platforms uh, like Power BI. It makes it much easier um, uh, to build and create dashboards um, with that data warehouse rather than using the transactional database, which may require you know, a whole series of joins and other um, uh, uh, techniques in order to d display a particular piece of information. So, um, hopefully that gives you um, a high level overview of all of the reporting options that we have available with Clarity. Um, what we wanted to do now is just touch upon the, the kind of the ease of use of using Clarity um, and, uh, and, and how easy it is to create a new attribute and how easily it is available uh, to include within your reports. So um, I'd like to hand over to my colleague Matan. He can uh, uh, proceed with the demo. So um, I will stop sharing my screen. And if we can just make uh, Matan the presenter. Um, Matan, um, over to you. Jamie, uh, thanks a lot for that intro. Let me, uh, uh, can you hear me clearly? Yes, we. I can hear you well. Okay. Let me start sharing my screen. Okay. Uh, again, just uh, uh, check. Is it? Uh, are you able to yep. see my screen? Yep. We can see your screen. Okay. Great. Okay, perfect. So um, I'll just quickly, uh, in the interest of time, uh, just want to highlight uh, the powerful feature, which I think Jamie just touched upon. Um, 
Uh, I think uh, from, uh, you know, different customers, different organizations have different needs. Uh, and, you know, uh, um, as you would have already seen, uh, uh, so Clarity is very uh, customizable, so you know, uh, just to cater to all those needs. Uh, so, how does it reflect in the reporting side? So, uh, I'll just uh, you know take walk you through a use case where, um, let's say, uh, in in an organization, um, the main focus is to view, uh, let's say, the perceived benefits based on a division, and a division is not an out of the box. Uh, field. So, um, you know, uh, the first step would be to just uh, start creating this field. Uh, so we just uh, give the name and then uh, say, you know, uh, we have, let's say, three divisions. This is business technologies, con consumer products and operations. And uh, this is what we want to use as the main, um, uh, say, factor for slicing and dicing, say, the benefits data. So uh, the first step would be to just create this and uh, make it available for uh, the products or the projects. Um, and then uh, you see a couple of checkboxes here, include in the data warehouse and include in the data warehouse trending. Uh, you know, these are extremely powerful as in, so when, when uh, all uh, we have to do is just click on this and uh, save. And when the next time the data warehouse is populated, all the data in this field is automatically available. Um, and including the data warehouse trending is, takes it even a step uh, further. So if we want to use some trend analysis and uh, eventually, you know, when we talk about AI and predictive analysis, uh, so you need a lot of data at different time uh, points and that's what that offers. So uh, we just uh, say include it in the data warehouse and, uh, you know, save, uh, save this. Um, and let's uh, just take the example of, um, now I'll just move to the Power BI um, tool. Um, and, uh, you know, the field that we created, the division, would uh, now be available for us in any of the third party. I mean, just using Power BI as an example here, but any third party reporting application, uh, if it's able to connect to the uh, database, uh, which is the data warehouse in this case. So we'll be able to use the division and pull it. And in this case, you know, just created a view which will probably uh, give a funnel of, okay, so these, these is, this is the revenue distribution and, you know, by um, different divisions. So what is the revenue uh, which is accumulated in each of these? Um, and also it's it's uh, it's it's powerful to uh, you know say create a different uh, visualizations it's very easy um and uh, power bi gives options of using it, it's it's as simple as you know uh, what i'm doing right now like i can uh, you know all i want to say you know a group um by the division and i want to see the plan benefit so i can see for each division uh, you know what is the plan benefit so, and uh, these are some of the views available and also uh, uh, Microsoft lets people, you know, the third party publishers publish their own views. Uh, you know, this is one of the views that, you know, um, uh, I, I'm showing you here. So there are many such uh, really good visual uh, visualizations that are readily available. So that makes it immensely powerful and combined with the fact that we already have a data warehouse to work but it, it makes it really simple, right? And uh, all uh, one has to do is then publish this uh, view that we just created. And uh, just to go back um, to, so this we are back into Clarity now. Um, and you can see that, you know, this is integrated into the application. This is one of the tabs in the application and I've just published the view. And um, I can already see, you know, the, the new visualization I created is reflecting here. So it is that easy, that simple, and that powerful, um, you know, uh, in terms of uh, customizations. And, um, uh, you know, like what Jamie mentioned, what makes it all uh, really great for reporting is the ready uh, availability of the data um, um, warehouse. And it's, it's also easy to add any of the custom fields uh, that, you know, we create for, uh, that an organization might want to use. Uh, so uh, that's the short demo we wanted to show. Um, and, uh, you know, the data warehouse is not only for third party applications. I mean, of course, um, all the various other options like, uh, you know, the Jasper Soft and all of, all of those reporting uh, options can leverage the data warehouse.
which is which is available um so jamie should we uh, shift to the last recommendations yes yes so i'll if i uh, if i could take presenter control back and then uh, and then you can step us through um those those, those yep. final recommendations sure so please bear with me. So th thank you for sharing uh, uh, that insight in, into the demo. I think from from an architectural standpoint, the fact that we have that data warehouse is you know extremely valuable, you know, and uh, uh, you know it's something that you know I would encourage all of our customers and prospects to really think about, you know, how we can maximize uh, you know the reporting capabilities of Clarity. Um, okay, so I will share my screen. So um, the final slide, uh, we really wanted to give you some insight into our recommendations of when to use each of these reporting options. You know, uh, I, I can quite imagine that, you know, some of the audience might be thinking, well, you know, there's a whole array of different options here. How, how do I choose the right one? How do I know which is the the appropriate approach for, for which audience and, and for which use case? Um, so um, uh, Matan's going to take us through some recommendations uh, based on our experience uh, in, in, in the industry. So uh, Matan, over to you. Thanks, uh, Jamie. Um, so, uh, you know, th this is uh, kind of the spectrum of various options uh, that is readily available in uh, Clarity to uh, uh, build visualizations and reports. Um, to start with, um, I think the simplest ones, and th this is almost, you know, uh, readily available or there is with without any uh, additional effort needed to build them. So, um, uh, for all, all of uh, the various um, objects in Clarity, like say it may be a project or an idea or a product. Uh, so for all of them, you know, the initial landing page is a list view on which Jamie uh, showed a while back. Um, so this in itself is a very uh, uh, powerful uh, tool to uh, say, you know, if, um, and it's, it's ideal for actually taking, uh, viewing the data at a glance. Uh, so uh, the, the important ones about, say, at the projects, you know, how the projects are doing. Um, but not only that, you know, if, if that data needs to be exported, let's say, to a CSV or an Excel so that further pivot charts can be built, uh, etc. So this this is the best uh, suited one, and it's, it's readily available, and that's the big advantage. And if we go a little right in that spectrum, we have uh, the dashboards um, and uh, what we call as portlets, which which are um, built using a framework which is um, already inbuilt into Clarity. So there is no additional uh, third-party tools that are needed to do this. Um, and it's uh, comparatively quick and easy to build such uh, views. And um, this is, again, very uh, quite powerful if you want to just click uh, or say, uh, do a quick summary or a storyboard, uh, so to say, you know, of uh, it could be the portfolios or, you know, a, a set of product portfolios or the projects that are executed. Um, and the big advantage is, like I said, you know, it's it's built in the framework, so it's easy to build. It's quite fast and uh, um, and also uh, it can be downloaded to other tools like Excel and uh, PPT. Um, and moving uh, uh, to the next uh, uh, available option is the Jasper Soft Reports, which, um, which is primarily, I think, you know, the best way to use these is, you know, um, um, though we we talk a lot about, you know, uh, uh, various un analytical reports and how, you know, the report landscape is changing, but something that most of the organizations still uh, use and probably continue to use is have standardized reports. Uh, which have their, you know, which solve their uni uh, unique use cases, like uh, uh, say a KPI report for the products. Uh, so if if an organization has uh, various departments and all of them have KPIs, and you know, you need to be able to measure uh, the, the progress of these KPIs in a standard way. 
So, uh, you know, JasperSoft uh, reports help in standardizing all of these outputs so that, you know, um, uh, if you want to, sp uh, say, implement this org wide and uh, get the reports for different departments to see how they are doing. So it will help in comparing different uh, organizations and departments, you know, if you have standardized reports with uh, specific formats. And uh, going on uh, to the third party BI tools. So this is, uh, uh, you know, uh, this is where uh, this is an option if the need of uh, the report is to have great visuals and also uh, say uh, perform some uh, analysis on the data, right? You know, uh, like uh, I, I was showing, you know, you can just click on a particular division and see how they are doing. And you can further drill down and see, you know, how a specific uh, you know, technology area within the division is performing. Um, or, you know, another uh, classic example is, you know, you, if you are trying to uh, do your portfolio planning, you have a fixed budget and you can set the budget and see what are the projects that you, you might possibly execute in the next year. And then you can just move the budget, like say, increase the budget and see what more you can achieve or decrease the budget and see, you know, what you will, what will drop out. So these sort of analysis becomes possible, you know, if uh, the data warehouse and the data is integrated with third party uh, uh, BI tools. So, uh, so this gives, I think, uh, uh, a spectrum of options which should uh, cater to most of the reporting needs. Um, you know, most of the organizations would have. And uh, so, Jamie, uh, I think back to you. Hey, that's great. Thank you very much. Um, so that concludes our, our session <clears throat> on, uh, on on reporting. Um, and I think we are overrunning uh, for time in terms of uh, when we were scheduled to take um, a coffee break. Um, uh, Ejit, do you have a, uh, a view on uh, the, the time that we should uh, take for the coffee break? Should we just reduce that down to 10 minutes perhaps? Uh, sure, Jenny. I think it would be nice to have a break. Uh, so it's 38, 39 now. Uh, so we can start at 10 to 1 if that is okay with everyone. So 12.50. Yes. It's going to be 11 yeah. minutes so, break. Okay. That, 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 that sounds great. So um, uh, to, just to make everyone aware, uh, the, the event will remain open, I believe. Um, uh, we, we'll just be on mute and then we'll uh, reconvene in, uh, in 10 minutes from now. Happy. So meanwhile, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to put them in the chat and we will look into them. Excellent. Thank you.
I'm um, sorry. Could 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 you make uh, Madhavi uh, please the uh, the presenter? Sure thing. Excellent. So. Uh, Madhavi, all Mad yours. Thank you. Excellent, Madhavi. So if, if you're able to uh, just share your screen and uh, I'll I'll kick things off. Yeah, sure. Just give me a, a one second, uh, Jamie. Uh, I'm just trying to make sure. No. The, uh... No problem. I hope you're able to see the screen now. Excellent. Yes, we can. Yep. Thank um, you. So if you. It, if, if you were able to play, uh, just put that into full screen, um, uh, that would be great. Done. Fant Ready. Fantastic. Okay. Okay. So um, it, it's always a little challenging when you're uh, when you're working in a remote environment to know whether yeah. <laughs> everybody else is kind of back back at their desks and ready to go. Um, uh, exactly. I, I, it, it, it looks like we have a, a good attend uh, good attendance uh, for the session still. So, that, so that's great. Um, so let, let's get things kicked off. Um, so everybody, I'm uh, I'm, I'm really pleased to uh, uh, introduce uh, Madhavi Ashwin uh, from uh, First Abu Dhabi Bank uh, to talk about their uh, clarity journey so far. Um, um, it's a it's it's a real pleasure and honor to have uh, Madhavi uh, present in the session. Um, uh, she's a, a PPM professional that you know I've got a lot of uh, respect for. Um, I've seen her operate very effectively uh, within uh, First Abu Dhabi Bank, and she brings a, a wealth of experience uh, to the topic. So we're we're very fortunate to have her uh, with us today, and, and I would encourage you know attendees of the session uh, uh, feel free to um, ask questions, raise a hand, uh, put questions in the chat, and uh, we're we're happy to take them uh, th throughout the course uh, of the session. And um, uh, just to keep things interactive, I'm, I, I'm likely to uh, to ask one or two questions myself throughout the session. So, uh, uh, Madhavi, perhaps if you could just move yeah. on to the first slide, and I'll, I'll maybe just conclude my introduction. Um, sure. <clears throat> so, um, Madhavi is the um, uh, VP for Portfolio Governance and Assurance at, at First Abu Dhabi Bank, and um, uh, I've personally uh, been working with Madhavi. Um, uh, since the beginning of the year um, on FAB's uh, 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 PPM journey. Um, uh, Madhavi's uh, background, uh, she has a, a wealth of experience um, uh, in, in kind of across PPM, uh, predominantly in leading uh, uh, PMO roles uh, at a number of um, uh, other financial organizations, um, as well as uh, First Abu Dhabi Bank. Um, so uh, she, she's well placed uh, to share her uh, industry insights and experiences um, on on their journey so far. So, Madhvi, um, I'll hand over to you um, yep. and uh, I'll, I'll ask questions as and when uh, appropriate. Sure, thank you. Thanks for that lovely introduction, Jimmy. And it's uh, my pleasure to be part of this session and thanks for the opportunity too. So, uh, pretty much sticking on to the agenda very quickly on what's our objective in terms of this PPM implementation and how did we go about finalizing the timelines and what we are planning to implement as part of our scope and the future roadmap. Uh, we can also give you what we went live with. That will be a good insight. And, uh, and, uh, and of course, I'll be sharing a couple of lessons, what we have learned along the way in this quick uh, implementation and how we are planning to improve in the coming uh, phases. So quickly moving on to it. So FAB uh, being, uh, you know, the uh, conceptually uh, with the vision to grow stronger, this year uh, post the merger, we have uh, started our transformation journey. And uh, one of the quick 
uh, things which we have identified is to uh, change the way we work uh, in terms of tools, technologies, and bring in a significant uh, overall to the uh, portfolio management uh, function itself across the bank. So in terms of our, our strategy uh, alignment for 2020 uh, across the group, it's just not IT, uh, it's just not the group technology, uh, but in fact, uh, in fab you would see that uh, clarity ppm as a uh, function as a tool as a methodology uh, is being implemented across the bank and it's just not restricted to the it which is in most of the organizations as we see so in in all strategic alignment uh, we kicked off this uh, project uh, sometime i think in february you have the timelines and uh, you know, we've been very fortunate to be associated with uh, Ignite also in terms of, you know, quickly organizing our demos and, you know, uh, helping us to do a couple of uh, POCs, uh, which made us move towards this tool over the number of other tools which we have seen. Uh, and we made a quick decision too in the month of uh, March and April and uh, sort of a quick win, we have started phase one with the key functions which we would like to leverage and bring in value to the organization. So mostly uh, I have seen, uh, you know, this entire session revolving around a lot about agile methodology. And I think, uh, you know, we sort of did this, though we didn't call it as an agile, agile, but uh, we sort of did an iterative approach uh, sort of an agile quick delivery, uh, which we have seen a lot of value for our internal customers here within the FAB. So phase one kickstarted in the month of May uh, with detailed uh, workshops and uh, we went live with the phase one on September 3rd, uh, end of August, uh, which was a really great uh, achievement. And within a span of three months, I think, uh, We've together uh, with uh, Ignite's help churned out quite a bit of uh, value to the organization. So, which is predominantly starting with uh, the executive dashboards. So, when I say executive dashboards, these are purely meant for the EXCO members who now have access to these dashboards where they can view the complete portfolio investments and the status. Where do we stand in terms of our uh, investments for the bank, uh, for the organization, for the group? Uh, and where do we stand in terms of the benefits, uh, the budget, actuals, commitments? And uh, the biggest uh, key takeaway from this is by implementing these dashboards. It might sound very simple, but it has got a very uh, powerful integration with our ERP system, the Oracle Fusion. Uh, keeping in mind, uh, you know, it's quite complex. Uh, the executive dashboards are now being accessed all the way from the top, and it's not the bottom-down approach. Actually, it's the top-down approach where all the senior members in the bank actively access this and make use of this dashboard to make certain decisions and uh, have conversations around it. Uh, the next, uh, yes. Sorry, Jimmy. Madhavi, yeah, d d just to come in, that, that's um, uh, it, it prompted me to to ask the question. Uh, how did you arrive, or, or maybe I, I know the answer, but maybe you can share. Uh, how did you arrive at um, the this original view of the scope for phase one? So, how how did you decide that you wanted you know the executive dashboards to be one of the first deliverables, and 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 what what was the driver behind having things like timesheet and integration with ERP in that first phase? Um, so so what was it that the organisation was looking for that kind of influenced the roadmap? So. Uh, Jemmy, uh, I think you will also agree when I say that, you know, any PPM implementation, a minimum period is expected is two years, but then we cannot keep everybody waiting for two years. And just after the integration, uh, you know, when we kicked off our transformation journey, uh, we thought it is quite essential to help the senior management, the uh, finance, and all the required stakeholders to make the decisions effectively 
we thought uh, you know this is this is very very uh, valuable for everybody to have that as part of phase 1 priority 1 scope uh, in the absence of you know uh, just to eliminate you know various uh, data sources so basically we would call it as we wanted to build a single source of truth for everybody yeah. and not having to you know uh, collect multiple inputs from various uh, departments and then put together and then they, they fly over the PPTs and then, you know, it becomes really complex and cumbersome. So basically, if you ask me with these executive dashboards, we lo no longer do any PowerPoint presentations. So we straight away log in and then we demonstrate where we are on in terms of the uh, you know, investments and the uh, status. Mm -hmm. Uh, because it gives the entire end-to-end -end view with, of course, with a lot of unique filters, you can uh, drill down by, you know, rack status, you can drill down by the benefits type, the methodology, uh, it's there, you know, you have even from the business perspective, uh, we went a little bit ahead in terms of, uh, you know, making sure that we have the product owners mapped because we are moving towards that, uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, the different methodologies implementation. So it's a good start. And, uh, and it's also essential that to show that value to the uh, EXCO. So that's how yeah, we absolutely. started. <laughs> and, uh, and of course, we wanted to bring in and standardize a lot of uh, uh, reporting mechanisms. Uh, uh, you asked me a question, why project management and timesheets? This is again, uh, you know, to bring that uh, uniformity, consistency in what we report. Again, the key objective is to have a single source of truth. Uh, everybody sees the same status. <laughs> I'm sorry. So that uh, it was very, very essential for us to eliminate any kind of, you know, uh, PPTs, different versions of truth. So we want everyone, all the stakeholders to access one status yeah. for every project. And of course, the roll up. So that was uh, one of the key things which is really helping us. And we thought it's very essential that you need to, if you have uh, substantial investments approved, uh, it's very, very essential that you know there is reporting, there's monitoring, there's tracking, and the governance. So instead yeah. of going, you know, in a iterative, uh, typical uh, approach of going by module by module. Uh, these all prompted us post integration that these are very very essential to start with and which will give immediate you know, tangible benefits for us so yeah, in terms absolutely. of timesheets uh, this is really helping us uh, to capitalize and again to show because we are moving towards capacity planning you will see our the future roadmap so it's a good start to have timesheets first in place if one needs to have the capacity planning done yeah, and, and I think one yeah. one of ob one observation that I would make about what 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 we're seeing at Fab, and without wanting to kind of jump forward to kind of what what has worked well, what one point that I would like to highlight is, you know, the 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 power and the value that's delivered or for having executive dashboards like this in that first release. Um, you know, can cannot be overstated because it influences all sorts of things, like, for example, yeah. user adoption. So, you know, um, if uh, your project managers and, and other stakeholders in in uh, who are using the system, you know, they can be very motivated <laughs> if they know that the executive team are uh, getting a a clear line of sight into uh, yes. the, the performance of their project. So, th there's a whole host of um, uh, auxiliary benefits of, of having such a high profile deliverable as part of that first phase. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, pl pl please carry on. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and uh, to speak a little bit about the integrations, of course, uh, you know, to manage the projects which are being delivered under agile methodology, uh, we, we are basically ready with this JIRA integration. And uh, I think we are in a comfortable uh, place to commence uh, that methodology also in FAB. Uh, so these two key integrations, I think, are very, very essential and uh, which we managed to cover in phase one. And of course, it comes with a lot of advanced reporting, uh, which we did uh, as part of phase one is the financial summary, where you have a lot of unique filters and grouping by portfolios, by programs, and you know by projects. 
uh, which is helping a lot. And uh, the benefits report, uh, of course, uh, which is uh, part of the advanced reporting, which is another key thing, you know, which gives a lot of transparency in terms of, you know, what are the benefits uh, which have been committed uh, for budgets, for measurements, uh, you know, by portfolio, by project. It's so easy for the finance to start this process of measuring the benefits and then it brings in a lot of transparency and it creates an indirect accountability amongst all the product owners who have committed for these benefits. So some of these we have seen and of course, uh, like any other organization, we have uh, an outsourcing uh, model. So as part of the reports, we have, uh, you know, uh, vendor it and its reports, uh, which is giving the benefit of, uh, you know, <clears throat> cost protection and things like that. Uh, there are several reports which have been delivered in the advanced reporting. I don't want to go into the details, uh, but uh, the essential part of it is as part of phase one in three months, uh, which we have managed to uh, deliver that. And of course, looking forward, uh, now the uh, next uh, set of focus is on the uh, investment planning because we are uh, approaching the new uh, financial year. Uh, which comes with the demand management process. Uh, we are in discussions with uh, the stakeholders as well as yourself to finalize that process and uh, uh, and also timesheets. Now, as an extension, they'll be completing the capacity planning. And also as part of phase one, we have had a lot of uh, uh, voice of the customer, which we have done internally, uh, which resulted in the last bit of it, the customer voice enhancement. So it's like uh, portfolio wise business unit wise, PMO wise, you know, various other Power BI dashboards and uh, a lot of other enhancements which we have <clears throat> in our backlog. Uh, we are looking forward to that too, which will bring a lot of value to the uh, end customer. So like I said, Jimmy, it's the top down. So there's a lot of uh, you know, value, there's a lot of buying, there's a lot of support. Uh, so we, we really look forward to the phase two implementation to, to be done in a very similar way. Uh, excellent. excellent. So some of the things which we have uh, implemented, you can uh, see the tile view, the JasperSoft, which is very clean uh, state of projects, individual project uh, dashboards. Uh, so the minute you click on each of these tile view, you will be benefited to see the complete details of that particular initiative <clears throat> all the way up to the uh, risks, issues, benefits, uh, your financial cost plans, and the latest status updates. So it is so easy to view this and uh, access this, and it's just a one-click button, which is fantastic, this Jasper view. Uh, and uh, it just lists every project, and you have the ability to, of course, uh, color code any of the cards based on whatever is your organization need. Uh, we've done in a different way based on the benefit style, based on the status and things like that. Uh, there's a lot of flexibility. There's a lot of uh, configuration features which are available to do that and uh, uh, make it very, very uh, pleasing for anybody to access and make them want to go through the status update. Uh, it's very cleanly organized, uh, immediately giving what are your milestones for the project and where we are and what's our next milestone. Everything. So if you look at the card, everything is at a glance. Uh, <clears throat> moving forward, status update is such a pretty simple thing which the project managers are benefiting. Uh, it's just filling like a form and nothing more than that. And it comes out very uh, neatly in a standard, unique, consistent PDF format, which has been, uh, uh, which is there as part of this uh, phase one. Uh, and yeah, the output of the project status report, which we have further enhanced uh, with a very neat look and feel. And you have the auto schedule options where you can send this to all your project stakeholders, your working group, your project board members. Uh, you can select the frequency and you can also run ad hoc whenever you like to share a report. It doesn't limit based on uh, any uh, certain uh, frequency, you can uh, input your status update anytime you require and churn out the required uh, uh, data as in, uh, as demanded by your stakeholders. Uh, we also spoke about the executive dashboards, just uh, a snapshot of it. 
of all the financial summaries and a drill down of the financial details, which is very, very useful for all the finance folks and PMOs and the governance units in the bank. And coming back to the lessons, a number of things worked very well, uh, even during the first uh, uh, phase, which is quite short. In fact, uh, a record uh, time of three months, I should say, <clears throat> the modern UX is really good. Uh, you know, unlike, uh, 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 you know, the way we churn out the PPTs and all of that, you don't have to struggle. The look and feel is uh, for the eye and uh, it has a lot of other uh, inbuilt advantages uh, so that configuration is so easy when it comes to this modern UX. And uh, <clears throat> of course, the remote collaboration, I'm sure everybody is uh, almost adopted to that. and. Uh, uh, I have to put on record that we have not had a single uh, a single uh, issue in terms of, uh, you know, this remote collaboration between FAB uh, and our partner Ignite in terms of uh, COVID. In fact, we started during the Ramadan days and it went pretty, pretty well for us without any pause, without any disturbance. And uh, nothing stopped us from moving ahead with our discovery workshops, design workshops and things like that. So. We really appreciate that, uh, how that has been approached, how that was addressed in a very consistent manner. Uh, and also uh, clarity uh, also helped us in terms of, you know, uh, configuring various portfolio investment types. Uh, so for our organization, we have a different structure. So clarity allows you that to have uh, different configurations, different uh, portfolio investment types, for example, the repurpose cost, uh, which is quite internal to us, and uh, we have many more coming up. Uh, so the ease of it, uh, the way uh, it helps our reporting is really very, very good. Uh, sure. And, <clears throat> and, uh, and, 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 and maybe, maybe, maybe if I could just highlight that point uh, for, uh, for those who may be not as familiar with the technology. At the beginning of the session, when Mark was talking about how clarity can support organizations on their uh, digital product management journey, and that we have these custom investment types that we can tailor um, uh, to, the, to the needs of our customers. So uh, Mark was talking very much about uh, value streams, product lines, yes. yeah. um, uh, product services, and so on. And you know, it was a lot of what Mark was talking about was the ability to speak the language of your customer. And this is a perfect example. You know, you won't find um, uh, any technology off the shelf that will refer to something a PPM platform that will refer to something as a repurpose cost. You know, that that's something yeah. that's unique to the way Fab works. And you know, we're fortunate that um, Broadcom has developed the product in such a way that we are able to use these configuration options like custom investment types to capture these repurposed costs and put them in a hierarchy, you know, the, on, underneath the, 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 yes. the projects, products and, and so yeah. on. So I, I think that, that, that that's proved to be really, uh, really valuable for Fab. Yeah, yes, and, uh, and, and I'm sure this will be extended uh, in the future. Like you yeah. said, uh, it, it is easily configurable uh, you want product wise, you want portfolio wise and many other investment types as you know, deemed by the respective organizations. Uh, it helped mm -hmm. us definitely uh, based on the model which we have here. And uh, uh, of course, in phase one, within that short time, we also managed to have the uh, training sessions, train the trainer. Uh, it, it was quite aggressive, but uh, we managed to onboard a number of users on to Clarity uh, via this train the trainer approach. And uh, it, it is, uh, it, it was it was useful and also uh, it uh, helps the, it did help the adoption uh, progressively, if not on day one. Uh, so also we spoke about executive dashboard, uh, which is, uh, which Jimmy also highlighted that you know, having this as the number one priority in the phase one uh, with such complex integration, uh, I think uh, there's a clear demonstration there that you know this uh, the value which uh, the system, the technology which can bring in uh, for the benefit of the rest of the organization in terms of you know uh, the governance around the portfolio investments, which is quite useful. 
uh, <clears throat> of course, there are a number of lessons we've learned along the way, uh, uh, be it because uh, of the aggressive timelines, be it because of the, uh, you know, uh, lack of knowledge of the tool, uh, because we, <coughs> we pretty much started immediately uh, after the selection of the tool. Uh, or be it because of, uh, you know, uh, in terms of uh, the requirements itself. <laughs> we feel that, you know, uh, we could have uh, assessed a little more uh, on the uh, Microsoft project integration and uh, choose the right one between what Clarity offers versus the integration options which are available. <coughs> Sorry. So, uh, the main uh, area where we have seen Jimmy is a bit of struggle is with the MSP integration, uh, but I'm sure all are resolvable. Uh, <clears throat> but I don't know. I wish uh, if Broadcom is uh, listening to us, we would like them to take this up integration very, <clears throat> very, very uh, seriously because MSP itself comes with a million. <clears throat> configuration options within that it has a number of fe uh, features which are hidden and it's very difficult to point exactly where the issue is. So we had a bit of struggle on the MSP integration because <clears throat> one is the benefit versus the constraints which will it will create directly or indirectly in terms of uh, <clears throat> when you're talking about one source of truth if people log timesheets uh, uh, against the projects, uh, you will <clears throat> end up giving the right status of the project because the project manager does not have the uh, control to stop the timesheets of users who have actually worked on it. And if they log, the timelines gets extended, for example, automatically. So there are a number of benefits because by doing so, you get to know the actual truth of the project. And on the other hand, you have <clears throat> some unhappy customers in terms of project managers because the dates gets extended. Uh, many a times we know that, you know, uh, the projects, the way they get reported or the way they would like to report. So there are advantages and disadvantages. Maybe uh, we should have gone the customized way or with the, the, uh, uh, the clarity inbuilt uh, workbench. Uh, so this is one of it, but uh, I think we'll get there too uh, with the help of Broadcom yeah. and Ignite to eliminate all issues. <clears throat> uh, nothing is yeah. a showstopper, but uh, uh, in, in terms of you know talking about what could have we could have done differently was that one I could pick up immediately. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> Any questions? Uh, I, I don't see any <clears throat> questions on this, Madhvi. Yeah, so please, uh, please carry on with the uh, with the look ahead. Yeah, so <clears throat> looking forward, uh, we have changed our approach slightly. Uh, so in terms of phase one, we went with a Big Bang uh, go live. <clears throat> what we have now done is we've changed it to the iterative approach or agile approach where we would like to see the quick releases and we are seeing that already. Uh, so we have changed our implementation approach basically to bring in <clears throat> value even more quickly than what we have done in phase one, basically. So we are looking forward to a lot of integrations with the Power BI uh, in terms of demand management. We are working with the uh, uh, digital uh, teams <clears throat> to bring in that uh, uh, process implemented in Clarity. Uh, so th these are the things which we have slightly changed our approach towards uh, the, uh, the current uh, day. I mean, what we have done in phase one, and I'm sure we've started seeing the results of it, and uh, we look forward to more. So the approach change also has helped us. In fact, we are seeing the quicker results and quicker delivery uh, and everything. And, and I think Madhvi, I think it's it's uh, it's definitely fair to say. That what, what one of the predictions that I, I mentioned um, ahead of the project was, you know, t t two things that you can guarantee. So number one is that what we think we're going to deliver in phase two 
um, you know, it will almost certainly evolve and change as we yes. learn, uh, <laughs> you know, learn things during the course of phase one, and 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 that certainly proved to be true. And then secondly, is that you know the more the moment your users get their hands on the system and they start feeling that benefit, um, you can guarantee that the um, the demand for things like custom reports and other things, you know, will will go through the roof. Um, and uh, you know we need to th we need to think of ways that you know we can s best serve those internal audiences. So adjusting our uh, delivery style um, to be uh, a more kind of agile approach uh, with a four week cadence um, is something that I think is going to be really powerful. So that you know we can serve your internal stakeholders um, uh, more more frequently and, and get the value to them sooner. Um, so and, uh, I think one of the reasons uh, why this approach has been taken, uh, Jamie, is you'll quite agree that uh, <clears throat> because uh, the value is seen in phase one, so there's sort of a hurry to see more, yeah. and uh, yeah. and your and uh, the adaptive planning is actually helping. I mean, it's okay we are moving away from the traditional way of doing things. Uh, of mm -hmm. having you know set of requirements and releases rather than you know quickly realigning with what the customer needs, I think uh, yeah. that's that's giving a lot of confidence. That's giving a lot of uh, benefits uh, in order yeah. not to lose the customers or you know making them unhappy. I think adaptive planning and uh, change in our implementation approach has started uh, seeing the benefits. <clears throat> I would recommend that approach yeah. to any. Yeah, but after phase one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, de yeah. you definitely, you you definitely need the foundation, and I think those <laughs> yes. foundations were, were well laid in the first phase, and then uh, only then can you really kind of adopt this approach. Uh, yeah, you, that, that that's yeah. an important point. Yeah, thank you for that. Yep. Yeah. So that's it from me, uh, Jimmy. Unless anyone has any questions, happy to answer them. Sure. Th th thank you, Madhvi. That that's really, really insightful, and I'm I'm sure our our, our attendees um, really appreciate um, uh, the the way in which you've uh, articulated uh, Fab's journey. Um, I'm just pausing uh, to see sure. if uh, we we've had any questions come in via the chat. Um, Edge, is there any uh, questions that we need to take by the chat or any questions that we are going to take offline? Um, Jamie, I have one question for Mark, if mm -hmm. he's still there. Um, this was asked during his presentation um, about the licensing. Uh, the interconnections <coughs> are done via workflows or are these pre-built in the product, uh, asks Costas. I'm, I'm still here, actually, I'm still here. Um, when you talk about integrations with the, is the question, uh, you don't know probably, but maybe Costas can tell with regard to the agile tooling. Um, Costas, I can unmute you if you like. Hello guys, uh, good morning to you. Uh, hello. hello there. Well, basically, I'm just trying to understand, uh, okay, the product, I don't know it, but um, usually there is, um, in this kind of products, there is, uh, there are workflows. So, yes. uh, so I was just wondering, because you presented quite a bit of, uh, you know, interconnections between uh, different, uh, let's say, features of the product. Now, mm -hmm. uh, to have, let's say, um, uh, how to say, uh, to have um, a move from product, sorry, from stage to stage. Uh, is it is it something that is pre-planned within, I mean, the logic is pre-planned or somebody needs to uh, put the logic behind this interconnection between the stages of, uh, of, uh, of working through the product? I understand, yes. So, yeah, I, well, the, the the framework to do that is in place, but okay. because obviously governance differs by organization, 
and the criteria to move from stage A to B or whatever change you want to see in your uh, investment status. Uh, that is something you have to configure. Okay. So the, indeed, there is workflow that determines when do we change a status or a stage and what should be the next step. Uh, the workflow engine is there. It's, it's powerful and it's pretty straightforward to configure. But mm -hmm. Yes, you have to set that up. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so that is the workflow. Yes, there's did, a workflow engine. Did, did the um, FAP uh, use this workflow during their uh, uh, implementation? Actually, this is from Madhavi. I, I mean, if, she's, if she can tell us. Yeah, so, so um, if Mad Madhavi um, Madhavi. may un un unmute herself. Um, but, but yeah, I, I, I can certainly confirm that we have used workflow in, in, a, in a whole host of uh, scenarios um, uh, within FAB, and, and, and we will continue in, uh, in, in, in the future. So, for example, uh, for, for the demand management workflow um, and, and, and other aut um, uh, process automation that, that, that we need to configure to align to uh, FAB's business process. Uh, Madhvi, if there's anything you'd like to yeah. add. Uh, yes, workflows definitely are part of this. Uh, for example, timesheets for review and approvals uh, is one of the workflow which I can mention. And uh, status updates is another workflow. Uh, plans is another workflow. Uh, so yes, there are part of yeah. workflows are part of this. Okay, just uh, <laughs> just to say, just to ask, uh, because Madhvi said that uh, uh, they were trying to do. Um, integration with uh, Microsoft project is there anything uh, is there any kind of a module that is built in into the um, clarity product by itself instead of using the Microsoft product is there something else instead yes there is you can choose we have a com well clarity comes with a complete planning feature so we okay. do have a work breakdown structure with dependencies and autos you can use it pretty well. Uh, it depends a little bit on uh, what the exact requirements for the planning are, right? So I think for relatively easy planning purposes, uh, Clarity can do the job. The big difference though, is that to use the Clarity planner and scheduler, you have to be online. Right? Clarity is a 100% web-based application so you need a connection to the application to, to modify or set up that planning. Where MSP is obviously an offline planner. You can use that on your laptop or, or device wherever you are without the need to have that network connection. Yeah, but do you have any kind of a migration tool or a, let's say a transfer tool that yes, I mean, you can do your MSP on, on the MSP offline and then transfer it into the... Yes, into yes. the Yes. So if it's yes, you can. It's, yes, it's a bi-directional integration. Yeah. Okay. okay. I, I think maybe if if I could bring some more light also to the uh, to, to this topic. So the, um, the the integration with Microsoft Project is something that's been in the market for you know many 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 years, and it's it's been enhanced and improved over the years. But but fundamentally, Microsoft Project and Clarity have different algorithms for how they do things like auto scheduling. Um, so th they are fundamentally different products that do do some things differently. So mm -hmm. um, there are there are certain best practices that, that, that we recommend about how the two tools can be used in uh, collaboration with one another. And, and many organizations use them, um, you know, many organizations use Microsoft Project with, uh, uh, with Clarity. There are some instances um, and, and some use cases that are more prominent with some organizations than others that they would wish the, the tool to work in a different way than it does and have certain constraints in place that maybe it doesn't. Um, so, um, you know, we, we will continue to represent the customer voice um, uh, to Broadcom, um, you know, to either, you know, enhance it's you know out off the shelf you know inbuilt native scheduling capability um and or 
um, to to extend and 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 improve uh, the the integration with Microsoft Project. All right. Thank you, guys. Excellent. Thank you for the question. Um, AJ, do we have any other questions, or or did you? Uh, if we don't, uh, did you want to um, uh, make any final comments um, uh, before we head to the uh, the raffle? Um, no, I'm still checking. Uh, I didn't see any other questions. If anyone would like to take uh, take the word, please raise your hand or drop me a quick message on the chat and I'll unmute you. Uh, but I think we can now uh, proceed with the, with the raffle as, as promised. So um, let me share my screen. We have a little Wheel of Fortune here that we've prepared for <laughs> all the participants. Jay, before you roll the, uh, the Wheel of Fortune, I'd like to thank Mark. Uh, Advi and uh, all the attendees, and I hope uh, this has been a very uh, fruitful session. Uh, you have our contact detail. If there are any further questions or qualifications you may require, please uh, feel free to reach out. And uh, as AJ mentioned, uh, in the session, we'll be sharing with you the recording of the session, uh, should you want to share it with uh, your colleagues internally. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you, Nabil. Uh, Jamie, what I would like to add as well is that uh, we do have a, a white paper on digital product management and an ebook, which which in fact pretty much reflects what was in the deck. I will share that with you so you can distribute them uh, amongst the attendees yeah. of the session. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Okay. Okay. Um... Okay, I hope everyone can see my screen. Yes. All right, here, here we go. Sirish Zafar, do we still have Sirish with us? Uh, no, I, I, I saw uh, Sirish, she was on the call up until just a few moments ago. <laughs> okay, if she stays till the end, I think we should we should uh, make sure she gets her her prize then. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, she was she Hi. she was certainly in attendance for the vast majority of the session. I think that would be uh, yeah, uh, uh, the, the, the fair thing to do. Yeah. All, all right. Well. <laughs> okay. Well, thank so, thank you thank you very much for that. Uh, no more uh, questions. Uh, uh, so, yeah. Okay, so um, if, if if I could just wrap things up, then um, I just want to extend uh, uh, my thanks uh, for uh, following uh, Nabil. Um, I, I'm extremely grateful uh, uh, to Eje for, for organizing the event. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, Mark, uh, as always, uh, we really value your insights and sharing your experiences uh, uh, with our customer base uh, and, and prospects here in, uh, in, in the Middle East. Um, uh, Matan, thank you for your support uh, on, the, uh, on, on the demo. And and uh, a really big thank you to uh, to, to Madhvi for for sharing her uh, her insights and, and her experience. Um, it's a really valuable contribution to the community. Um, and um, in, in in the next session, uh, we'll certainly have uh, uh, another customer uh, sharing their uh, sharing their journey and their insight. Um, as Nabil mentioned, um, you will have uh, our contact details in the uh, in in the follow up emails. Um, if you have any questions, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Um, and we, uh, we we thank you for your time. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.